Welcome to lecture topic number two. Today we'll discuss European exploration and some of the early attempts by European powers such as Spain, France, and England to establish colonies in North America. There are a few themes to keep in mind while viewing this lecture. First, we'll address the question of why Europeans wanted to establish settlements in the Western Hemisphere to begin with. Then, we'll investigate some of the early colonies organized by Spain, France, and England. Finally, we'll explore some of the early interaction between Native Americans and European colonists. Overall, you should be able to compare and contrast the early settlements undertaken by the European powers and the results of their actions for colonists, as well as for Native Americans living in the Western Hemisphere. A good place to start would be with the question of why Europeans wanted to explore new lands and establish colonies in the first place. There were many reasons why Europeans sought to establish colonies in the Americas. The goal of the next few slides is to outline some general motivations for colonization. One of these would be based on economics. Some were looking for shorter trade routes to the east, as Europeans wanted easier access to goods from Africa and Asia, such as cinnamon, nutmeg, and sugar, to add spice to their bland diet. However, they also sought access to silk and jewels. In addition to these items, many others sought gold and other precious metals, as well as land for expansion of their empires. While economics played an important role for many, others came due to religious reasons. Some wanted to practice their religion freely, as they hoped to escape persecution. Yet still others wanted to spread Christianity to new areas, as is shown with the woodcut here on the right. It shows Mother Maria de Jesus, preaching to Indians living in New Mexico. So here we see there was a missionary aspect to the actions of many. But there were other general factors as well. Some came seeking adventure and traveled because they wanted to discover new lands and were curious. However, there's one factor numerous people often overlook. A significant portion of people who became colonists were forced to do so. These were slaves. Africans didn't travel seeking gold. They weren't trying to spread a religious faith. They came because they were forced. A later lecture will explore in more detail some of the characteristics of the African slave trade, but some historians have described this as the largest forced migration in human history. Those were just a few of the general reasons why many traveled to what some called the New World. Now we can take a more specific look into each of the nation's colonization activities. Because the Spanish established the first permanent settlement in what became the United States, we'll investigate their actions first. This is the same map which was shown earlier, demonstrating some of the common trade routes from Europe to Asia. Because there was so much wealth to be had in the trade of spices, silk, and other precious metals, some in Europe hoped to discover shorter trade routes to the east. One such explorer was from Genoa, Italy, named Christopher Columbus. By the late 1400s, he was a skilled navigator who became obsessed with finding a shortcut to the east. In 1492, he convinced the Spanish monarchs, Isabella and Ferdinand, to finance a mission of discovery. He arrived in the Bahamas in October of 1492, and he believed he had found a shorter route to the Indies. Therefore, he named the people he came into contact with, Indians. This map identifies several of the voyages of discovery made by different Europeans. If you notice the routes shown in red, they signify the four separate trips made by Columbus to what he thought were the Indies. This slide shows two additional maps. The one on the left is from 1489 and it represented the world as they knew it following the voyages of the Portuguese sailor Bartholomew Diaz. In 1488 he rounded the Cape of Good Hope in southern Africa. The second is from 1507. It's an important map because for the first time we see a name designated to what they refer to as the newly discovered continent in Southern America. This was named for the Italian explorer Amerigo Vespucci who realized what came to be known as America was a new continent rather than the islands off the coast of Asia. Columbus was wrong when he believed he had found a quicker route to Asia and he was not the first European to successfully cross the Atlantic. However, his actions were very important. His voyages were sponsored by the Spanish crown, and they caught the attention of other European rulers. His actions were then followed with large-scale efforts to explore the region more deeply and to establish permanent settlements. We'll now continue with the discussion of Spanish exploration by studying the conquest of Mexico and then move northward, 
to focus on events in what was known as New Mexico. Cortes was another important Spanish explorer. In 1519, he landed in what is now Veracruz, Mexico, with about 600 soldiers. His ultimate goal was to bring back wealth and riches to Spain in the form of gold and other valuable jewels. The arrow on this map shows the approximate spot where Cortes and his men landed. Once there, they actually destroyed their ship as Cortes was intent on finding wealth in Mexico. He figured if they did find wealth, they would be able to rebuild their ship. If they didn't, they would die trying as he wasn't going to return to Spain as a failure. Cortes and his men did find wealth among the Aztecs, particularly in their capital city of Tenochtitlan. In a relatively short period of time, he and his men were able to conquer the Aztecs. There were many factors which facilitated the Spanish conquest of the Aztecs. First, Cortes and his men were allowed to enter the capital as they believed Cortes was the god Quetzalcoatl, whose return was predicted in Aztec legend. However, rather than acting like gods, the Spanish seemed to worship the gold and other precious metals as gods. So after a short time, the Spanish were driven out of the city, but then disaster struck. The disaster came in the form of disease. In this case, it was smallpox. This was probably the biggest factor which seriously weakened the Aztecs and led to their defeat. Estimates differ among various historians, but what's clear is that Native American populations were devastated by diseases brought by Europeans. The defeat of the Aztecs was also facilitated by additional factors. First, the two sides viewed warfare differently. For example, the Aztecs viewed warfare as highly spiritual and ceremonial. This can be seen with the different depictions of clothing worn by the two sides in the image on the right. The Aztecs are shown wearing colorful costumes, while the Spanish wear European battle dress. Finally, the Spanish brought technology in the form of horses and gunpowder, which were also factors. By 1521, the Aztecs were defeated, and the Spanish erected the new capital city of Mexico City to replace Tenochtitlan. The Spanish continued to expand their empire eastward, establishing outposts in different parts of North America. When St. Augustine was established in 1565, it became the first permanent European settlement in what would become the United States. However, the Spanish also expanded northward from Mexico into what is now New Mexico in 1598. In 1598, Spanish conquistadors, led by Juan de Oñate, moved into the upper Rio Grande Valley. The Spanish crushed villagers in the Pueblo of Acoma, who resisted the Spanish advances. Eventually about 800 were killed. The women and children who survived were sold into slavery, and surviving men had one foot cut off. The image on the left stands as a symbol of the Spanish presence in New Mexico, as the Spaniards employed the Pueblo's traditional adobe construction style to build this church dating from the 1640s. The Spanish remained in New Mexico for several decades until a rebellion succeeded in forcing the Spanish to leave for several years. The person who led this fight was Pope. He and others played on the tremendous resentment of the Spanish, which grew over the years due to the Spaniards' attacks on traditional Pueblo practices and the Christianity which was forced upon them. By the mid to late 1600s, many began to reject Christian rituals and return to their traditional ceremonies. Pope successfully united all Indians in New Mexico against the Spanish, and in 1680 staged the Pueblo Revolt. In this assault, the Indians united. They captured the city of Santa Fe and drove the Spanish out of New Mexico for about 10 years. In the end, about 400 Spanish colonists were killed, while the fighting continued until the end of the century. The Pueblo Revolt was important because it was one of the most successful Indian uprisings in American history. As has been shown, Spain was able to develop a vast empire in the Western Hemisphere in a relatively short period of time. We will now turn our attention to the French and their activities in North America. One of the most important early actions undertaken by the French involved the French explorer Cartier. In the 1530s, he undertook the first official exploratory trips along what is now the east coast of Canada. The arrow pointing to the purple lines on this map show the explorations of Cartier. Eventually, he explored the St. Lawrence River as far south as the present-day city of Montreal. His excursions formed the basis for French claims to North America. 
The arrow on this map shows the route of the St. Lawrence River followed by Cartier. Cartier was followed by another important Frenchman, Samuel de Champlain. Champlain founded the city of Quebec in 1608, which eventually became a key trading post as the French specialized in the fur trade. This drawing from 1699 shows the key role played by Native Americans in the fur trade as Quebec became an important city for commerce. This French engraving showing the beaver as worker and prey demonstrates the significance of the fur trade in New France. In the late 16th and 17th centuries, felt hats were a tremendous fad in Europe. The French eventually developed important alliances with Native Americans, particularly the Huron, which helped to maintain their access to a steady stream of fur pelts. In return for beaver pelts, the French offered trade goods, which were quickly integrated into the lifestyle of American Indians. Eventually, French claims in North America included the entire purple area shown here on this map. However, a later lecture will discuss additional exploratory trips made by the French along the route of the Mississippi River. The French successfully maintained their access to beaver, in part due to their alliance with the Huron initially established by Champlain. This began in 1609 when he accompanied several Huron in an encounter with the Iroquois. The Huron, with the help of the French, defeated their bitter enemies in this case and ensured the French traders access to the interior of what is now Canada. Champlain was important because of the important posts and trading network he helped to establish. Many referred to him as the father of New France. England's exploration and settlement was also important. We'll investigate some early explorers and then study the lost colony of Roanoke next. England's excursions began in the late 15th century when John Cavett was hired to explore the North Atlantic. The arrows pointing to the blue lines here indicate the travels of John Cabot in 1497. While Cabot's explorations were a start, the English didn't try to establish a settlement for some time. The first attempt undertaken by England, which we will explore, took place in the 1580s at Roanoke. Sir Walter Raleigh was the most important person associated with the establishment of Roanoke. He came from a distinguished family, but was also helped by his personal relationship with England's Queen Elizabeth. The proposed colony was located off the coast of what is now North Carolina. The circled area on the map indicates the location of Roanoke Colony. At the time, Raleigh chose to name the geographic region he was settling Virginia in honor of Queen Elizabeth, who ruled England for most of the latter half of the 16th century. She was described by many as the Virgin Queen because she never married. Roanoke was first settled in 1585 as colonists, including a large contingent of soldiers, arrived. Overall, the colony had a very unique purpose. The specific goal for this community was to serve as a base for pirate ships. Roanoke was located just north of the Spanish in Florida to enable privateers to attack these Spanish ships. Relations with local Indians were rocky at best, even though the English relied on them for food. This could possibly explain the eventual fate of the colony. This drawing from John White, a member of the colony, demonstrates the different methods used by Indians to fish. On the left, you can see the construction of weirs and traps. In the background, Indians are spearing fish in shallow water. And in front, they're fishing from dugout canoes. Communication between Raleigh and the colony was interrupted more than once as war raged between England and Spain. When a supply ship finally arrived in 1590, they returned only to find the colony deserted with the word Croatoan carved into a tree. No one is sure of the exact fate of the colonists, whether they were attacked by local Indians or were faced with disease or natural disaster remains a mystery today. So this early attempt to establish a colony ended in failure, but it would not be England's final such attempt. The next major attempt to establish an English colony was in Jamestown, Virginia. I recently traveled to Jamestown and had a wonderful experience. If you have the opportunity to go there, I would sure encourage you. You can click on one or both of the hyperlinks below to learn more about these historic sites. Jamestown was first settled in 1607 and is considered to be the first successful English colony in what became the United States. 
The organization of the colony was not in the hands of an individual, but instead controlled by the Virginia Company of London, a joint stock company designed to make money for their investors. There were many problems which faced the settlers in Jamestown. For example, their location was chosen as it was easily defended, yet it was in the middle of a swamp, and the summer brought intense heat and annoying insects. Many fell ill and were unable to work. Others refused to work as they were gentlemen simply out looking for gold. They were also ill-prepared to survive on their own without supplies from outside sources. For food, they relied on the local Indians, which were organized into a powerful confederacy. These were the Powhatan Indians, led by Chief Powhatan. One of the settlers, John Smith, was captured and set to be executed as he attempted to seize corn. Smith was later released, but not before he may, or may not, have been saved by Powhatan's daughter, Pocahontas. At the time, she was about ten years old. As Jamestown settlers continued to struggle in that first year, some statistics may demonstrate the lack of success in the colony. In May of 1607, 101 settlers arrived in Jamestown. When relief ships arrived the following January, only 38 remained alive. Smith later inherited a leadership position within the colony and established a trade network with the Powhatans to ensure access to food and other supplies. However, he also implemented a new policy which was unpopular among many of Jamestown's English inhabitants. It essentially dictated, You don't work, you don't eat. Under Smith's leadership, there was a much higher survival rate. At the outset of the winter of 1608, 200 settlers were living in Jamestown. By the following spring, only 12 had died. Even though Moore survived while Smith was in charge, he still was unpopular among some of the settlers in Jamestown as he forced gentlemen to perform manual labor. And then in 1609 he was injured. He was forced to return to England to seek medical treatment. Some additional information demonstrates the impact of Smith and his policies. By December of 1609, there were about 500 settlers in Jamestown, but that winter they experienced the starving times. Lack of food and disease struck the colony's inhabitants, and by May of 1610, only about 100 remained alive. Although the death rate was appalling, colonists continued to arrive in Jamestown. We'll see how a new cash crop led to an economic boom for the colony. While the colony continued to operate by the 16-teens, investors did not see profits. Eventually, the colony was saved by, of all things, tobacco. Smoking had become a popular habit in England during the mid-1500s, and John Rolfe had succeeded in developing a strain of tobacco which flourished in Virginia and was popular among smokers. Rolfe later married Pocahontas, the daughter of Powhatan, which led to an easing of tension between the Powhatans and the colonists. In many ways, Pocahontas served as a diplomat for her people, and she even traveled to England and held an audience with the king and queen. She died, however, before she could return to her homeland. Following the deaths of both Pocahontas and her father Powhatan, relations with Native Americans grew poor. By this time, Opakankano, Powhatan's brother, had assumed leadership of the Confederacy. As the English continued to expand their settlements, Opakankano struck back in 1622, killing about one-fourth of the settlers in a single day. The company responded by adopting a policy to destroy the Powhatans, and the fighting continued for several years. At one time, the Powhatans included a huge confederacy, symbolizing the strongest power in the entire region. It's estimated that at one time they included some 40,000 Indians, but by the end of the conflict with the English, only about 500 remained. We'll now discuss the final concept to be addressed in this lecture, and that's something referred to as the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange is a phrase used to describe one aspect of the interaction between Europeans and Native Americans. It involves a wide range of items brought by Europeans from the so-called Old World to the New World. These could range from plants, animals, diseases, ideas, and even trade goods brought back and forth between these regions. This chart shows some of the plants brought from Europe to America which were not native to the Americas before European contact. Among others, they include apples and beets, olives, and sugar cane. The list on the left indicates items taken from North America brought back to Europe. Just to name a few, they include beans, tomatoes, and potatoes. 
These were all crops from the Americas brought back to Europe. Also notice that tobacco was a so-called New World crop. Welcome to lecture topic number two. Today we'll discuss European exploration and some of the early attempts by European powers such as Spain, France, and England to establish colonies in North America. There are a few themes to keep in mind while viewing this lecture. First, we'll address the question of why Europeans wanted to establish settlements in the Western Hemisphere to begin with. Then, we'll investigate some of the early colonies organized by Spain, France, and England. Finally, we'll explore some of the early interaction between Native Americans and European colonists. Overall, you should be able to compare and contrast the early settlements undertaken by the European powers and the results of their actions for colonists, as well as for Native Americans living in the Western Hemisphere. Another aspect of the Columbian exchange would be disease. There's debate among historians as to exactly how many American Indians died as a result of exposure to diseases brought by Europeans, but they were devastating. Diseases led to more deaths and did more to disrupt the Native American society than any other single factor. In some cases, 90 to 95 percent of Indian tribes were destroyed as a result of their exposure to European diseases. there are some explanations as to why these diseases were so deadly. First, they were virgin soil epidemics. Because Native Americans had no previous exposure to these diseases, they had no acquired immunities. As a result, the diseases were very deadly and spread rapidly. Secondly, more than one disease would often plague a community at the same time. Finally, these were tough diseases. Smallpox, chickenpox, influenza, measles. These are just a few of the diseases which devastated Indian people. Today, using all of our modern medical practices, these diseases often don't have cures. Instead, we have vaccines. Knowledge of vaccinations were yet to come. What about diseases which were common among Native Americans? Well, as this figure from a burial site in Mexico which predates contact with Europeans shows, diseases were common in the Americas. The lesions on this figure suggest the individual suffered from syphilis. It's believed that syphilis originated in the Americas and was transported to Europe, where many suffered and died from this sexually transmitted disease. Now that we've concluded the core of today's lecture, we can review some of the highlights of the information presented. This lecture investigated the actions of Spain, France, and England as these European nations first explored and then established settlements in the Americas. Europeans and Native Americans interacted in many different ways. In some cases it was positive, while in others it was negative. Now you should be able to compare and contrast the activities of these different nations and evaluate the results of their activities for both their own countries and Indians living in North America. This concludes lecture number two. The next few slides will offer some hyperlinks to additional information on these topics and a list of sources used to create this presentation. Have a good day.